right, guys, we're going to get started. Uh, welcome to week 11, where we're going to be talking about loops, arrays, and libraries. Um, so congratulations. This is the last content lecture of the course. The next lecture, which will be two weeks from now, will just be project presentations. Um, so you guys should come out to that because we'll be giving two points of extra credit for that too. Um, last homework has been released today, which will be due um, next, next Monday, um, so November 28th. And then the final project has also been released on Notion. So check-ins are due by um, November 22nd, and then the project is due in November 29th. And we also have no more labs. Uh, but yeah, these are the announcements. Um, so we can go right into the content. Uh, we can have some quick review of event handlers. So we went over this a couple of weeks ago, the document object model, which is kind of loaded whenever you, I guess, um, start up JavaScript. So it creates its own representation of the page with a lot of these functions and properties that you guys have seen in the past homeworks and also labs. Um, I won't get into this now because it isn't covered in previous lectures, but this is kind of like the document object model. And we're able to edit um, and access the document object model through um, this document object that you see here. So you have like document.getElement by ID. So this just gets the element that has the ID food list and puts it into, um, usually you put like let x equals the document that get element by ID to like store uh, whatever is returned into the variable X. Um, yeah, and then we cover this also where every DOM element has an onClick function. Um, so if you want something to happen when you click it, uh, we have like button element dot onclick and then show greeting. And then you, for the function, you just put up the alert, um, howdy. Um, quick note that for show greeting, when you put uh, sh equals show greeting, you don't include the parentheses because including the parentheses would immediately call the function, but we want to delay it to the point where uh, once we click it, then it'll run it. We don't want to run it like immediately. Um, yeah, so we don't have to like add classes to modify the CSS. We can modify the CSS through um, like this thing called style.proper or style.background color. So background color is just like a property that we've seen before. Um, so basically we just do like element, which is um, the element with the ID color. Um, and just get like the style in the background color and set it to whatever is passed into the function. Um, yeah, so this is like the way you'd access it in the yellow element dot style that background color. And then we would be setting color to whatever is passed into the function. In this case, you can see that at the bottom red is passed in and that color is what's assigned to the value of red. Um, so this will change the background color to red. And then uh, here's an instance of like, sometimes we wanna like, have a function that has parameters, but we don't want to call it right away. So we would put it in an anonymous function uh, where we put like function and then within it, we have like more uh, brackets and then put change color within it. So that way it doesn't get called uh, when the JavaScript is just running through it, but it gets called whenever something is clicked. Um, yeah, do you guys have any questions on that? All right, sounds good. Oh yeah, so we can get to some new content now, which are which is arrays. Um, we can think of arrays just like as a list of values um, and we can like use them to represent multiple objects in one um, placeholder. So as an example, this is an example of an array. It's just like a shopping cart with like protein, caffeine, and bananas. Uh, we declare our variables the exact same way as we've been doing before. So we have let cart. And then on the right side, this is a new syntax. We declare an array by just putting whatever values are in it within square brackets. Um, just think of it like as a list and you just put square brackets around it. Uh, we separate each item in the array using a comma, um, also like with the list idea. And then here's just like the first, second, and third elements of the array. And then just like in a normal list, you, you don't put a comma after the last item just because uh, there's nothing after that. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of like the basic syntax of how you would declare an array. Um, Length is part, like the property of all arrays. Um, it's a property, not a function. So in order to like access it, you just do dot length instead of dot length parentheses. Um, so since it's an attribute, this will just return the length of the array. So there's three items in the cart. So it's, it'll console.log3. Um, yeah, it'll be useful if you wanna like uh, loop through something, which is something that we'll get into later in the lecture. Um, but yeah. Yeah, so this is a little bit tricky too. Uh, array indexing, uh, for some reason in computer science, or I guess in like web development in general, all of the um, arrays are zero index. So think of like the first element in the array as in order to access that you do like cart bracket zero. Um, 
I don't know why it's like that, but that's just how it is in pretty much all coding languages. Um, so think of like, if you want to get the first element of, of an array, just subtract one and put it in that number. So like, if you want to get like the third element bananas, just subtract one and you do cart two to get bananas. Um, and then, yeah, this is how you access things in an array. Just put like the um, array name and then brackets and then whichever index you want to go into. So here apples is zero, oranges is one and the bananas is two. Um, yeah, do you have any questions about that too or? cool um yeah so where are arrays useful why are we teaching you about arrays in general so right now we've just been doing things that allow you to edit one element at a time like document dot get element by id um but what about like classes because we told you like you can put classes and for css you can style uh you can write one rule and then it'll apply to everything with that class um so i guess like when you uh i guess access it through the document there's going to be a lot of elements with that same class which is exactly why there's this function, document dot get elements by class name, um, and this will return an array, which is what we talked about, of elements that have the class food item. Um, yeah, let's see. Yeah, so this is plural. It's not get element by class name. It's elements. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, document dot get element by ID, a food list. Um, it'll return um, like this outer UL tag um with i guess like the three nested allies within it but if we want to get document docket elements by class name with food item then it'll uh return these three elements within it so um yeah this is what food would be set to it's just like an array of um, list elements and then you can access it through what we talked about before with like food bracket zero one two yeah um, yeah right, we just probably skip this slide Oh yeah, so I guess with this new um, array structure, we might want to have like a easy way to, I guess, go through the entire array. Uh, we don't want to like sit there and code like array zero, one, two, three, all the way up to like however long it is. That's why we have um, loops. So there are multiple kinds of loops. Um, there's while loops, do while loops, uh, for each loops, and also for loops. Uh, in this class, we're only going to be talking about for loops. But if you want to learn about the other ones, you can like either just Google it or you just take like 61A or any CS class will teach you about loops in general. Um, but yeah, we're just gonna cover four loops in this class. And um, oh yeah, that's that's a cool picture. Uh, yeah, so a for loop will allow you to like repeat some code until a certain condition is met and you can repeat it a certain number of times. Um, so I guess it does something. Um, without you having to write out every single iteration. So say you want to like print out the numbers one to a hundred, you're not going to sit there and like write console.log one, two, three, all the way up until hundred. Cause that's like a big waste of time. So that's why we have four loops to do it for you. Um, and it, even though it might look like a bit intimidating uh, is actually really clean and like maintainable, easy to like um, control, like what it's actually outputting. Uh, so this is an example of a for loop and we're going to get more into like the syntax of what it means uh, right now. Um, so yeah, like the start of the for loop is basically creating a variable named i. So that's why we have like the let i equals one. And i stands for index. Usually like um, if you have like for loops within for loops, you do like i and then j and then k. Um, but that's like not really important. Um, but yeah, you just have like let i equals one. Um, and that kind of starts the um, i or the value of i at one. Um, and then we'll be seeing um, how i is important as we go through the loop. The next thing it does is it checks the uh, condition. And this is what we call the terminating condition. So i less than 10, once i is greater than or equal to 10, then that's when the loop ends. Uh, but since we set it to one at the beginning, um, it's not gonna actually uh, terminate yet. So we need to make sure that this is true before we do anything inside the loop. So i is less than 10. And then we do, after we check, like if i is less than 10, we do whatever's inside the loop. So right now it'd be like counting to nine and then it'll add like one. And then after we print out or console.log that one, then we're gonna go to this like increment stage. So this increments i by one every time. Um, so we do i plus plus, but you can also do like i plus equals one, or if you might be one, two, you just do i equals i plus one. So this would just add i every single time. And then kind of like the, the flow that it goes through is after it increments i, then it goes back to like i is less than 10, checks if that's true. 
and then console.log and then increment check if it's true and then console.log again. Uh, so it kind of follows that kind of, uh, I guess, cyclical structure. Um, but yeah, so this is kind of like why you use for loop because you can take these um, nine lines of code and condense it down into three. And you can think of like, if you're doing like a hundred lines of code, you can still maintain like these three lines of code to print like one to 100. Um, so yeah, quick question. What will this print? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it'll print uh, zero to nine and then, all right, this is like a redundant example, but this will just basically print zero to 10. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see, I guess if it's confusing to you, think of it like the first thing you do in a for loop is initialize the variable. So that's like let i equal zero. And then the second thing you do is check if the condition is true. The third thing you do is go into the loop and do whatever's in it. The fourth thing you do is increment the loop variable and then you repeat steps two to four until the condition is false. And then at that point you just exit the loop. Um, so yeah, this will print uh, zero through 10. Um, yeah, this is basically like, this is how we would integrate, I guess, arrays and for loops together. Um, this is why the card dot length property is useful because we don't know, like we, we're not going to be sure of how many items we inserted into the card. So using card dot length is an easy way to figure out how long the array actually is. And, uh, this will basically go through every item in the cart and just print it out. So print protein and then caffeine and then bananas. And then... Uh, notice how we started like let i equals zero and then we go into like cart dot length. So cart dot length is three, but if we go do like cart bracket three, it's going to give us like an out of bounds error because protein, caffeine, and bananas are zero, one, and two respectively. So there's no like third element with the index three. Um, so yeah, when we do like four loops and we're iterating through arrays, start it as zero and then end it while i is less than cart dot length instead of less than or equal to. Um, yeah. Or do you guys have any questions about that? Yeah. Um, with the length, okay. is length equal to how many elements are in it, or is that minus one? Because mm. with index, you start with zero. Yeah. Right? Would the length be three or two? That's a good question. It'd be three. So length is just like just normal counting, like one, two, three. Um, but the index itself, the last index within this um array is two. So that's why we have like the four that i equals zero, i is less than cart dot length. Because when we go into the loop, I will never be equal to card dot length as in three, um, just because we have this check to make sure it's less than it. Um, so that'll just kind of go zero, one, two, and then length is three. Yeah. So, yeah. Any more questions? All right, cool. Um, yeah. So this is a portion of the class where you might find it really useful, um, just in industry in general, and also. Um, I guess your final projects, but this is the part of the class where you can basically take other people's code and then use it for yourself. So these are what we call JavaScript libraries. Um, JavaScript has like a set syntax of rules that define like a logical executable environment, which is like stuff you've been using throughout like the past homeworks and labs. And libraries are built on top of a language and basically act as tools that we can just kind of integrate into our code really easily. Um, if we want to like create something complex, but we can just use a library to do it for us. So these are some examples of um, libraries. Uh, you can exit out to see how it looks like. Uh, yeah. So this is a cool like particles library where you can just kind of move uh, the mouse around and it'll uh, move the particles. You can also click to add more particles. Um, if you want to like code this from scratch, I have no idea how you would do it. Um, but conveniently, uh, there's a lot of documentation about how you can just like get this library um, and download it, and then you can integrate it within like your code within probably like three to four lines. Um, so yeah, that's really useful. Um, let's see, it's like a confetti one. Uh, I don't even know what these do, to be honest. These are just a bunch of libraries you guys might find useful for your final project. Um, Snap SVG, I believe, turns photos into SVGs or something like that. Um, yeah, these are just a bunch of libraries that I guess like when you see a website that looks really nice, it has a lot of fancy like functionality. Odds are they didn't actually code it themselves or like build everything from scratch. They probably like imported libraries to do most of the work for them. Um, and it's really cool. Um, 
you're able to build really complex things without having to do much work by yourself, but being able to combine, I guess, different libraries in a way that maintains the coherency of your website and makes it still look clean is kind of what adds that like impact effect where this is like a good website. Um, Matter.js is also very popular. Uh, ALS is something that I wish I've discovered earlier. This is basically like a library um, for animating on scroll. Um, so you can like see and you can do like fade up, fade down, um, fade right and left. Um, and it's as simple as just like downloading the library and then you just do data AOS equals fade left and it'll automatically do like this fading for you. Um, I didn't know about libraries when I was doing my final project. So I coded all of these like animations by myself and it looks really bad. Um, but using libraries like this will be a lot like more efficient with your time and also look a lot cleaner. Um, let's see. Uh, this is also another library. I don't really know what this does. Uh, oh yeah, type is another cool one. Um, you can basically animate the typing and it does it for you. Um, this is kind of like what it looks like. Yeah, so you can like go back, you can write whatever you want to. Um, I guess it's like a cool way to like make it seem like you did a lot of work, but in reality, it's just like whatever this code is. Um, yeah, you can basically just write like, if you just have like this new thing and then uh, give it like whatever you want to type here, then it'll basically type it out from front to back. Um, they have like these move and deletes just for like this extra functionality. Um, but yeah, integrating these like libraries into your code is actually pretty simple. Um, if you just like Google how to do it, um, then and a lot of them have a lot of documentation on how to actually do it too. Um, yeah, you're free to use any of these for your actual project, um, and these might be something you're interested in doing for one of your features um, as listed in like the project spec. Um, but yeah, do you guys have any questions? All right, cool. All right, I'm gonna give it to Kelly Tran then to do our design lecture. Uh, <laughs> Okie dokie. So for your final project, if you guys have already looked into that, um, you guys are going to be building your own website. And um, for the most part, many people end up doing a portfolio. So here's how to find inspiration and like how to build your own portfolio. So for starters, um, let's find part one, finding inspiration. So um, can anyone tell me what they think an eye for design is? Just shout it out or raise your hand. So really like right or wrong answer. If not, it's okay. I'll just give you the answer. Um there honestly is no like true eye for design. It's more of a facade and like because nothing really comes to us naturally, but rather it's a gradual understanding of how systems and trends work in the overall large picture. So you want to train your eye for design through diligence, discipline and hard work. And many people try to say like, oh, like I'm just like not a good designer or I really don't have an eye for like nice things. But in all honesty, you can train your eye to see like what looks good <laughs> based on like current trends um and just like over time you just become a better like designer and you see what looks good and what works so like I was previously saying like a lot of people try to say oh I'm not a creative person I like I know how to code but I don't really know how to make something look nice. <laughs> and um while like I understand like it, it may be intimidating for people who are like feel like they're not naturally good at um, designing. Um, if you look at your childhood, you've probably finger painted on white butcher paper or like built sand castles. Like everyone's done something creative once in their life, especially when you're children. So um, don't limit yourself just to like saying like, oh, 
I'm this, so like I'm not a creative person. It's like personality tests. There's like Enneagrams and like Myers Briggs, and people try to say, oh, because I'm like an ESTP, I'm not creative. But that is not true because none of us are natural creative people, and you shouldn't just wait for inspiration to come to you, but rather try to find inspiration. So like I previously said, inspiration only comes when you're actively seeking it. And you have to make the commitment even if you're busy, which a lot of us are as students. Um, we can look at some uh, apps that you use on your everyday lives. And in this example, I believe it's Lyft. So you can ask yourself questions like, oh, why do we have this like big go button? Or um, like, why are things designed the way it is? Um, like why is the layout of it like that and by asking ourselves these questions we're able to find um, and see why UI designers like how they work and how we get closer to the mindset that you're looking for so I really like this graphic it's how to look at the world as like an artist so every artist gets asked the question where do you get your ideas and the honest answer artist answers I steal them which may seem kind of counterintuitive like why are you stealing like ideas or like designs but in all honesty a lot of artists and designers like mm -hmm. quote unquote steal but it's not like fully 100 like plagiarizing or anything but rather you're taking inspiration from others and the world around you so when you are looking at something that you might like, you can remix it and take other people's work and take the aspects you like from that and then just make them your own. That's a crucial part, just making them your own and making sure you're not like copying the entire thing, but rather take inspiration from what you really like and try to make that your own. So when you're making a Figma mock-up, a lot of times um, designers will just paste stuff they really like or like want to like kind of mock it up as. So like, let's say this middle one is your like, you really like some of these designs. Um, so just like putting your Figma mock up and it's good to surround yourself with pieces that you enjoy in order to like give yourself inspiration. And many times the first um, design that you make, it won't be right just on the first try. So you have to keep going at it, you have to keep working at it. Maybe it's not like the greatest, maybe it's not good, but it is something and you'll learn how to improve and you can always ask for feedback from like fellow students or from us. And over time, as you work on it, it'll get better. So always be part of your work, even if it's just like a really bad rough draft that you're like, oh, I like made this in like five minutes because I forgot the deadline was at like 11.59. So just be proud of yourself. It's progress and you'll just keep working at it. Okay, so now that I've kind of outlined like, oh, how do you find inspiration? Now, where do you find good designs? There is so many resources out there, but here are a few links. Um, I personally really like coolers.co and gradients. If I'm ever looking for a good color palette, there's mood boards, um, behance.net. There's just so many different guides and um, just resources out there if you ever need um, for design. And also reading is also a very big part. I know a lot of us probably don't read on our free time, but you definitely should if you have time. UX Design has some really cool articles outlining like, like some of the newer, newer like UI design stuff. And then, yeah. And then shout out to Pablo Stanley for the gifts that are used today in our lecture. And while like all these resources are great and you have to make sure you like actually design you can't just read posts go to design meetups like watch design vlogs and then you realize like oh i didn't become a better designer because you actually have to design but you're not alone so if you ever need help on design you can always ask any one of us um for help you can come to our office hours just send us an email beforehand <laughs> And if you're still feeling a little discouraged and saying, like, oh, well, I still don't think I'm a really good designer, that's okay. I think you guys should watch um, The Gap. It's like The Gap, it's like by Ira Glass. It's technically like the video isn't by him, but he talks over it um, as, and the video is like kind of like a transcription of it. I think it's a really good video. It's just two minutes. Definitely check it out. I'm not going to go over it, but. In, it's basically the message is saying like, oh, you know, when you first start off, you're going to feel like there's a gap between you and other people. And in order to 
kind of shorten that gap and like to get to the level where you want to be you have to keep working at it and try not to feel discouraged um, even if you feel like what you're putting out there is not like your best you always have potential and you can keep growing as long as you keep working at it so now let's get into part two which is portfolio building and product design mm -hmm. so uh, a little disclaimer I am like not a, a great designer by any means but I really like design so yeah I'm gonna use Kelly Hu's website as an example because she has a really cool portfolio um let me find it. So this is Kelly Who's. She's not here today, but this I'm gonna use her sign for blue. It's really dope. So first she has her little like intro. This is like what she does, full stack product designer. And then when you go down, she it goes over a few of her projects she's done. And she has really cool like little animations that you hover and other links to stuff. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but this is essentially what a design portfolio can look like. So yeah, it's essentially something you're proud of. Uh, recruiters will look at this in addition to your resume if you're submitting one. And honestly, it is a lot more important than your resume because it gets to showcase what you have done, but in a more creative format. And it actually shows like, oh, she can design it. She doesn't just sit, like say it on her resume. So let your personality shine um, through your design portfolio. Let me go back to the show. And then what goes in the design portfolio? Um, I kind of, you kind of saw it on Kelly's, but there's project case studies. So you can do like re user research, design justifications. For a lot of people who are starting out, um, redesigns of like maybe some logos that you might not like, or like a landing page of, of an app that you think could be done better. Redesigns are so fun and they're, you have a lot of creative liberty because you get to just choose what to do with them. Um, you have an about me, way to contact you, social media, all that stuff. Yeah. And then where can you put your portfolio? Um, some people use GitHub pages to host. And then there's also Squarespace, Webflow, Wix, PDF. Um, which is acceptable, but honestly not recommended. There are so many other resources that are probably better. Um, and then there's always Medium. And then how can you build a portfolio, especially if you're a designer who's like, you just want, you're just entering the design field and you don't have that much experience or you don't know where to start. There is a really cool um, daily UI challenges where you get a hundred days of like daily UI challenges and they send you every day in your email and you got to do a little like UI challenge essentially. And honestly, like practice always is like always going to make you better at something. So if you're interested in like getting better at UI design, definitely check um, this link out. There's also unsolicited redesigns, like I previously said, like if you want to redesign a logo that you think is really ugly, like just redesign that and you can add that to your portfolio. Product ideas, if you want to make like, if you've always had a, like a really cool product idea and you want to design like their logo, um, a website maybe, you can do that. Design class project, design-a-thons, which we are also promoting one um, on our ed, you should check it out for more details. And then there's always Adobe Creative Jams. And now to the hard part, the actual design part, because I could talk about design forever and not actually design. So what are some tools you can use to design? Uh, we taught you guys Figma, which you can use for industry standards or like prototyping or visual design. Um, there's also Sketch and Adobe Creative Suite, which you guys get for free because Berkeley students. And then if you ever want to do like visual design stuff, I like Procreate if I'm ever wanting to like draw stuff, because um, I feel like on an iPad, you can do more stuff with that. And then um, I kind of talked this up about this before, but like, what can you redesign? Just anything that you're passionate about will work. Like it doesn't have to be something super crazy. If you really like a video game, but you want to think of a better UI, do that. If you want to do a visual interface for a, li a list of your current reads, that'll also work. Like you can do anything as long as you're really passionate about it. And now let's get to more like designing in school specifically. Berkeley. Unfortunately, it's kind of hard to get into design classes here because there is like no design major um, and you have to be very self-motivated. 
Um, but there is a list if you are looking uh, interested in taking a design course here. We also have a lot of student organizations such as Berkeley Innovation, Design at Berk, Innovative Design, uh, and Art Decal. Um, and honestly, any club here that has a social media or a website, they probably need designers, even if they don't ever promote it. Like, honestly, like a designer is still a crucial role of marketing. So definitely, if you're ever looking to join a club um, and you want to like help them with marketing or design, that's always an option. Uh, as for events, uh, Berkeley Innovation usually has conferences, innovative design as well. And then I know Jacobs has like a speaker series. And like I previously said, like there's no design major here at Berkeley, unfortunately. So it really doesn't matter what you major in um, because there is since there is no design major, you can do anything you want and you can still pursue design. There's also, um, if you guys don't know about it, Berkeley does offer like a design certificate um, through Jacobs. Um, so that's also really dope, but I know it is kind of like hard to get into the classes as well. So uh, like I said, like you don't have to major or minor or get a certificate in design, even if you're interested in it. So yeah, um, just remember if you're ever feeling discouraged, remember the gap. You're always, you're, whenever you're starting out with something new, even if it's not design in any creative field, there's gonna be a gap between you and people who are like four years ahead of you. They're gonna have more experience and therefore they've had more practice. So don't feel discouraged, just keep working at it and you'll get better at it eventually. And like I said, don't be discouraged because you don't have a design major and just continue to keep creating um keep creating like basically anything like keep creating because practice is good and then think about the why when you're ever designing um because um intentional design not just designing um just to design you can always sit down and mess around I really like doing uh like random like posters on Figma and honestly a lot of fun so yeah uh now I have like a huge resource dump you can look through these links on your own time. There's so many books. Cofolios is really dope. They're basically like really, really dope portfolios from uh, people from like top tech companies. Um, you can just look through them on your own time as well if you ever need inspiration. And then ADP list. If you ever want to have a one-on-one -on -one chat with a mentor from a company, this is a really cool resource and it's open to the public and you can just sign up for a like kind of basically like a coffee chat online. Uh, if you ever need like help in design, if you ever have questions on the industry and it's not just limited to design, they have like data science, um, like product management as well. I think it's really dope. And then there's some podcasts as well. Newsletters, communications, there's like Discord and Slack channels. And then these two conferences actually happened in the spring. Config is hosted by Figma and then there's Adobe Max, but keep an eye out for that because those are free and usually hosted in SF. And with that, good luck to you all on your final projects. This is the last lecture. So yeah, I'm gonna stop sharing and meeting.